So today we are going to uh, talk about um, a type of cell that we've kind of um, skipped over in a lot of our other discussions. And one of the things that this cell is going to make us think a little bit about is going way back to the beginning of the semester and thinking about sort of the distinction between innate and adaptive immunity. Um, so if you remember, we talked about um, sort of general things that define innate immunity or general things that define adaptive immunity. Um, when I think about innate immunity, um, I think about, um, that's sad. <laughs> when I think about innate immunity, I usually think about um, speed of the response or the fact that the response is pretty early. And I think about receptors that um, are recognizing broad patterns. Um, instead of the really specific receptors, I tend to think of cells that are from the myeloid lineage. Um, and when I think about adaptive immunity, um, I tend to think about um, a slightly delayed response. I think about um, specific receptors um, that are made by VDJ recombination. I think about immune memory. And I think about cells that are coming from the lymphoid lineage. Um, and I guess for innate, I could also say no memory or same response every time. Um, and so if you were to sort of ask me how to define these two types of immunity, this is kind of what I would, I would tell, tell you. Um, this uh, image that you see on the slide sort of goes through those same types of processes um, in terms of telling you kind of what the definition of adaptive immunity um, is usually thought to be. Um, and today you're going to see some ways where this distinction is a little bit muddied. Um, we are specifically going to talk about a type of cell called an NK cell. Um, NK cells are natural killer cells. Um, you saw them in a few slides at the very beginning of the semester. Um, and every so often you would ask me a question and be like, what about that NK cell that you're not talking about? Um, because I generally didn't really say a whole heck of a lot about them. I sort of avoided them as much as possible um, because of some of the issues that we're going to see today. Um, and you will, I know there are places where people are like, well, are they innate or are they adaptive? I'm confused. And I'll ask you at the end today if they're innate or if they're adaptive. You can, you can tell me what the answer is. Um, so we've already talked about a few different types of T cells. Um, those that are helper T cells making cytokines, the CD4s, um, the CD8s, which are cytotoxic and recognize uh, class 1. We've talked about NK T cells that recognize lipids presenting on, presented on CD1D and also that are also cytotoxic. Um, but there is this group of cells known as NK cells or natural killer cells. Um, one thing to notice right away that is different about NK cells compared to the T cells that you see on the left is that the T cells all have this purple TCR. NK cells do not have a TCR. Um, they have their own types of receptors called NK receptors that we're going to spend some time talking about today. Um, NK cells were originally defined as cells that had the uh, protein on their surface called NK1.1. So they were originally defined by flow cytometry. 
Later on, people realized that some cells with NK1.1 were T cells, and that's how they got named NKT cells. Um, so even though these cells really aren't the same, aren't particularly related, they got the same kind of name because they had that same full cytometry marker, NK1.1. Um, and so the NK cells are cytotoxic cells um, that they don't have a T cell receptor, um, and they are going to be uh, acting um, to kill other cells as we will see going forward. So if we look at that little distinction I wrote on the board about innate versus adaptive, um, one of the things that we can see about NK cells is that NK cells um, come from the common lymphoid progenitor, um, which is the same cell that eventually leads to B cells and T cell differentiation. So they develop on the lymphoid lineage, from the lymphoid lineage, as opposed to our macrophages, our dendritic cells, our granulocytes, which are part of the myeloid lineage. So here you can see um, NK cells developing um, on this side. You can also see NK cells um, both in a cartoon form and in an image um, like you saw in lab one under the microscope. And if you looked at, had found that cell under the microscope during lab one, you would have called it a lymphocyte. Um, because in terms of how they look under basic microscopy staining, they look just like lymphocytes. And so based on that, would you put them as innate or as adaptive cells? So here, these look kind of like adaptive cells. Another key feature of NK cells is the timing of their response. NK cells are known for um, acting very early, particularly in response to viral infection. Um, so in the shaded blue, you can see that uh, the viral replication in our uh, individual. You can see that type 1 interferons, interferon alpha and beta, are made super early. Those are those innate immune cytokines that we've talked about coming from PRR recognition. You can see in this black line the timing of the CD8 T cell response to that virus. And in the blue line, you can see the timing of the NK cell response to that virus. Um, NK cells are strongly turned on by type 1 interferons. So interferon alpha and beta activate NK cells. And so you can see that the NK cells are activated right after that early burst of type 1 interferons. Um, you can notice that when the CD8 T cells are at very high levels, that's sort of when we take the virus and actually get rid of it. We clear it. When the NK cells are at high levels, that's actually kind of when we stop the virus's initial exponential amplification. So they're both probably doing something pretty important for that viral infection. If you look at this information, where would you put NK cells in terms of innate or adaptive cells? Innate. So they're responding rather early. So you can see that, again, life gets a little bit messy. Um, so NK cells, as their name suggests, function by killing things, as they are natural killer cells. Um, these cells are going to be able to either kill self cells that are injured or that are under stress, or virus infected self cells. And so you can see either injured cells or infected cells being killed here. This is because the NK cells contain cytotoxic granules, um, which can be secreted directly at the cell that needs to be killed, um, just like we saw with CD8 T cells. And so the killing mechanisms that NK cells use are identical to the mechanisms that CD8 T cells use for killing. 
This is one reason why I put the NK cell lecture after the CD8 T cell lecture. Um, and so here you can see those mechanisms of cytotoxicity, although this slide bothers me so much because it's everything that I want in a slide except that they secrete the stuff this way when they should secrete it this way toward the infected cell. I don't know why there's all the stuff's getting secreted in the wrong direction. <laughs> and if, it would just, if that was just switched, this would be perfect. <laughs> um, but what you can see is that things like perforin, Granzymes, um, interferon gamma are all made by NK cells and can all lead to the lysis of virally infected cells, um, just like we saw with CD8 T cells. This doesn't show um, FAS and FAS ligand interactions, but in fact, those also can be a part of this process as well. Um, and as I previously mentioned to you, NK cells are activated by type 1 interferons. Um, and so when we have some type of um, viral infection, some innate immune response, our cells can make type 1 interferons that can stimulate NK cells. That will allow those NK cells to proliferate. It will allow those NK cells to differentiate. And then those NK cells will be very good at doing this job of cytotoxicity. Um, so in these ways, NK cells are really similar to things you've seen before and sort of fit in easily with things you've seen before. The place where NK cells sort of get to be unique is in thinking about their receptors. So the T cell has a T cell receptor. The B cell has a B cell receptor. NK cells have a whole bunch of receptors. As a group, we can call them NK receptors, but there are individual types or subtypes of those NK receptors. So we can divide up NK receptors in a few different ways. One of those ways is shown here. Um, NK cells have receptors that are known as activating receptors as well as having receptors that are known as inhibitory receptors. What you should notice is that the activating receptors all interact with um, proteins that have ITAMs in their cytoplasmic domain. The ITAM stands for immunotyrosine-based activation motif. A for activation is in the activating receptor. <laughs> And so we can get signaling that leads to turning the cells on through these types of activating receptors. The inhibitory receptors, by contrast, have a different type of domain in their cytoplasmic region. This domain is called an ITIM. It still has a tyrosine. The T still stands for tyrosine. The difference here is that this is an immunotyrosine-based inhibition motif. Um, and so phosphorylation of the tyrosine in an ITIM leads to an off signal in the cell. And so signaling through these receptors that have an ITIM will turn the cell off. So the ITIM with the I leads, is in the inhibitory receptor. And so um, the NK cells are going to be signaling through um, both of these sets of receptors. You will notice that we also have a few different naming conventions for different types of NK cells. Um, so there are some that have names like NKG2C or NKG2E. You'll see some that have names like NKG2A or NKG2B. We'll get into the details of some of those as we go forward. You'll also see that some of them have names like KIR or KIR. Um, here used to stand for killer inhibitory receptor. And then we found there were some activating ones. And so that didn't really work anymore. But it turns out they have immunoglobulin domains. So they're now killer immunoglobulin domain receptors <laughs> um, instead. Um, and so we can see a few of those different uh, receptors. You can see this list 
um, this table from your textbook as well. So we've got sort of the NKG2 group. Um, they're present in both mice and in humans. They're basically uh, lectins. Um, we've got um, things like the Kiers. Um, in mice, we have a bunch that have names like LY49 and then some letter. Um, and so you can see that there are lots of different ways that we can think about these receptors and divide them up. One of the reasons why it is important to talk to mention that is that if we look um, in the human genome, we can see that each one of our cells has the genes for many NK receptors. So your cells have lots of keyers and lots of other NK receptors in these different regions. So it's not like your NK cells have one receptor, they have a whole bunch of them. Um, another thing that you should, uh, that I will just mention right now, which we will see come back as we talk a little bit more, is that if you look at the NK receptor loci, they also rank super high in terms of being really diverse from person to person. So remember, MHC is like number one in terms of diversity from person to person. I think the NK area is number three in the genome in terms of diversity from person to person, yeah? If, if I'm remembering it right, and I could be missing up the order here, actually no, this is number two in terms of diversity. It, the other one is, is length of haplotype, is the other. I don't know. <laughs> I, I know that there are two that we talk about as diverse, and I know that a couple we talk about as long. Um, so these are super, super, super diverse. Um, so I kind of just said this, but I'll say it again because it's always helpful to be repetitive on things like this. So what does that remind you of, this extreme diversity of NK receptors? Yeah. What? Yeah. MHC. This, is, ha, this starts to make you think a little bit about MHC potentially being important here. Um, and NK cells um, and the sort of idea of how NK cells worked were first really well described um, based on experiments like these um, done by Klaus Carr um, that allowed us to understand something called the missing self hypothesis. I'm going to draw out some of his experiments. You are going to see in a couple places, it feels like I'm writing really redundant stuff on the board. Um, the reason is that if you take really like incomplete notes on this experiment, it becomes really hard to understand them later. So you can see I'm actually going to be using my notes to make sure I like explain it exactly right. So I'll point out a couple places where it can get confusing. Um, it's actually not that bad. There's just one place where I know that if you don't write the notes correctly, you'll look at it later and be like, the what? Who? Um, so um, Carr was looking at uh, trying to understand the biology of cancer. He's in the Department of Tumor Biology. Um, and so he took this cell. It was a cell line. And it was called RMA. Um, just so you know, um, it doesn't matter right at this second, but you will care later. RMA cells are mouse cells, and they are from a mouse with the H2B MHC haplotype. They, he took this tumor and he put it into a mouse. That mouse is also a mouse with the H2B um, MHC type. And when he took this cell line, and injected it into this mouse, the mouse got a tumor. And the mouse died. The thing you want to be clear about when writing about this is that in some outcomes of this experiment, the mouse is going to die. In some outcomes of this experiment, the tumor is going to die. 
And so if you just write dies in your notes, then you, when you go back later, it will be very confusing. Because sometimes the thing that dies is the mouse, and sometimes the thing that dies is the tumor. So in this case, there is a tumor, and the mouse dies of that tumor. Um, and so uh, he wanted to try to understand um, what exactly was going on in this process. And so he did a few different types of experiments. So first, he actually made some mutations in the tumor cell, the RMA cell. So he made a mutation. and made a version of this cell that was called RMAS. And when he put RMAS cells into the mice, the tumor died. And the mouse lived. So somehow, there is a difference here. Somehow, he had made it some kind of mutation in this cancer cell so that it didn't live in the mouse. And when he actually started to look, he was able to find that the immune system had killed the tumor. So somehow, the immune system could not kill the original RMA tumor. But with this mutation he made in the RMA cell, um, then, in fact, the uh, cells could uh, be killed. Um, so he, and when he looked at the mutation in the RMAS cells, he realized that the mutation led to them having no MHC class 1 on their surface. We now know a lot more about the mutation, but really what he knew is somehow the MHC class 1 did not get to the surface of these cells. He thought, huh, that's weird. Does this whole business have to do with MHC class 1? Um, and so he did this experiment. He did this experiment where he put the tumor into these mice. And then he did an experiment where he said, well, what happens if I just give this cell MHC back? Because he was like, this is definitely not an MHC thing. This is, that's crazy. So he, put, so he then made RMAS cells that had MHC. He actually did all sorts of fun mix and match experiments with this, but I'm kind of simplifying now. And when he put MHC back in, there was a tumor. And the mouse died. And so it seemed as though in this middle situation, when there was no MHC on the surface of the tumor cell, suddenly we were getting an immune response that was killing the tumor. There seemed to be an immune response to lack of MHC. So when MHC class 1 was missing, something could kill the cell. And if MHC class 1 was present, then the cell was OK. And so somehow, there was recognition of missing MHC, or missing self, <laughs> leading to the missing self hypothesis, um, which, led, which suggested an alternate immune defense strategy. So if we take a second to think about this strategy before we go into the details of this strategy, why might it make sense that we have some part of our immune system that recognizes when cells do not have MHC class 1 on their surface? Why would that make evolutionary sense? Yeah, Rob. Yeah, we talked, when we talked about MHC class 1, 
we talked about all sorts of different ways that viruses specifically mess with MHC class 1 presentation. That's because the virus wants to hide from CD8 T cells. And in many of those cases, the virus will do something like here you can see pulling MHC class 1 off the cell surface, redirecting trafficking of class 1, blocking peptides from coming in. That actually blocks presentation of the virus peptides on class 1, but it also stops all class 1 presentation. So these cells end up having no class 1 on their surface. So because so many viruses do that, and that's such a common strategy, it kind of makes sense that we would have a way to detect cells that are missing class 1. If you're missing class 1, there's probably something wrong with you. Um, and so that is really how these NK cells work. So a big part of this process involves um, NK cell receptors that are known as inhibitory receptors. Um, so NK inhibitory receptors can be of multiple different classes of NK receptor. So we've got them from all different groups. But one thing that's important about them is that in general, NK inhibitory receptors all have the same ligand. And that ligand is MHC class 1. So NK inhibitory receptors are binding to class 1. Um, and specifically, we might see something, we see something that looks a little bit like this. So here you can see class 1 with, in yellow, with a peptide in red. This gray box shows you where a cure might bind to that MHC class 1. You can see that it's not kind of binding in the middle, making specific contacts. Um, it's binding in a very general sense to um, any MHC molecule. It really doesn't care what the peptide is. It's binding in a completely different area than the T cell and is not kind of fully seeing MHC plus peptide the way the T cell is. It's really just looking to see, like, is there an MHC molecule that's present here? Um, these NK receptors um, are uh, present in the germline. They are made like normal receptors. There is just a promoter that leads to their transcription, and they're on. And so based on that, and based on what I'm showing you here about the cures, do these NK cells look more like innate or adaptive cells? Which one? Innate. They look way more like innate cells. Their, pa their receptors are for broad patterns. They're not recognizing the specific peptide here. They're just recognizing yes or no on the MHC. They don't care what the peptide is. It just is MHC present or absent? And there's no VDJ in making these receptors. So these are germline receptors for broad patterns. And so you can start to see why I never answered your question before about whether they were innate or adaptive. Um, I'm going to switch the order of the next two slides. Um, and so this is sort of the idea of what we think about with these NK inhibitory receptors. So a normal, happy, healthy cell will have MHC class 1 on its surface. That MHC class 1 will bind to an NK inhibitory receptor and turn off the NK cell. Sort of like you know the, the normal cell is saying to the NK cell, no, I'm good, chill, and turning that NK cell off. And so there is no killing. If, however, the cell has been infected with a virus and we've removed the NK cell, uh, the MHC, there is nothing to inhibit the NK cell, and the NK cell can now kill that cell. Um, and so we can see NK cell mediated killing. Um, there are situations where cells will lose MHC in addition to um, virus infection. In particular, if a cell is under um, a lot of stress, um, it may stop MHC production. Um, as we will see later, a lot of tumor cells stop producing MHC. Um, if a cell is under heavy replicative stress, it may stop making MHC. And so 
this is kind of nice. A whole bunch of sort of bad news cells can get um, detected in this way. Um, there's one other NK inhibitory receptor that I want to mention. That NK inhibitory receptor is called NKG2A. Um, it's super annoying because you want A to stand for activating, and it doesn't. <coughs> um, NKG2A is an inhibitory receptor. It has ITEMs, and it also works with a partner protein called CD94. And NKG2A has a special ligand that it binds, um, which is a ligand known as HLA-E. What does HLA-E sound like? Sounds like an MHC class one. Have we ever learned about HLAE at this point? No. So we didn't learn about it as a class one, but it sounds like a class one. If you look at its structure, what's it look like? Class Looks like class one. So um, the thing about HLAE is that HLAE only presents one kind of peptide. And when a protein is made as a transmembrane protein, We've mentioned that it needs to be synthesized on a ribosome that's part of the rough ER. And the way that that usually happens is that the ribosome picks up the transcript. It starts reading the transcript. It makes a little bit of the protein. And that protein is often what's known as a signal sequence, sometimes called a leader sequence, that says, you sh we should be in the ER. And so then the ribosome goes to the ER. <laughs> and continues its translation at the ER. And so any protein that is a transmembrane protein has that little beginning piece called a leader sequence or a signal sequence, which eventually gets cut off. Here you can see that MHC class 1, like HLAA, has a leader sequence in order to be uh, there for its correct biosynthesis. It eventually has to get cut off, as leader sequences generally do. HLAE only presents leader sequences from other MHC class 1 molecules. And so basically, it is presenting a peptide that is indicative of correct MHC class 1 biosynthesis. Um, and so this is sort of a way that we can present peptides that are um, indicating that MHC class 1 biosynthesis is correct. So HLAE with a leader sequence from another class 1 molecule is the ligand for this inhibitory receptor, CD94 and KG2A. Um, and so if we have correct MHC biosynthesis, that's another way that we can inhibit NK cells. Yep? It's an MHC that presents like a part, of, a precursor part of MHC. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and so that receptor also can lead to this kind of inhibitory um, receptor engagement and no killing of the NK cell. So there are two things you might notice here. One, I put white boxes on part of this image, which tells you that there's something else going on that I have not yet told you about. <laughs> um, and we can think about this in a few ways. We can say, well, you know, okay, so the, like, are, are we sure this is really the whole situation? Because red blood cells, if you remember, don't have class 1. How is it that red blood cells don't all get killed by NK cells? We should have no red blood cells. We should all be dead. In addition, there are some cells of your body that have pretty low levels of MHC class 1. And there are reasons for that that we can talk about. Um, we'll talk about actually a little bit next week. So for example, neurons have really low levels of class 1. They have it, but they don't have very much. And so you really, like, why don't the neurons all get killed? Like, this seems dangerous. <laughs> this seems like a problem. And all of those problems are answered by the fact that this is not actually a full, complete slide. Because not only do NK cells have inhibitory receptors, they also have a second group of receptors known as activating receptors. And so in order for an NK cell really to work, it has to get a plus 
signal, an activating signal, as well as the lack of a minus signal. And so red blood cells, you might imagine, don't give them the plus signal, or the neuron doesn't give it the plus signal, the activating signal. And so that's how those cells can remain safe. The activating receptors are shown here. Um, there are a bunch of different activating receptors. One of the most important details about activating receptors is shown right here on this slide, which is that in many cases, we do not fully understand the ligands for all of the activating receptors. So there are some cases where we do, but there's all, there are also some cases where there's a lot of confusion. So for example, you can see that in a couple places it actually lists MHC here. Like it, forget that. <laughs> We're, we are not going there. Um, so um, with NK, so really the key thing to think about here is that there are ligands for the activating receptors and they are specific ligands. We don't fully understand everything that goes on with these ligands. There are a few specific ones we know stuff about, but in terms of like every single one, there's a lot of confusion. So I'm going to tell you about a few of the specific ones, like some hi hit the highlights, but realize that, this, that there's still a lot that's not well known about NK activating receptors. So one type of NK activating receptor um, that you can see here is an NK activating receptor um, that is um, here it's listed as CD16, but it also is noted to be the FC receptor gamma. FC receptor gamma, which you can see right there, CD16, FC receptor gamma, binds to the FC portion of an IgG antibody. So you can see that down here. And so if some type of infected cell has antigens on its surface that can bind to an, I, an antibody of the IgG isotype that can trigger an NK activating receptor and induce this NK cell to kill this antibody coated target cell. Does that sound familiar to you at all? Yeah, Nick. So we learned about it the same day as opsonization, but it's not called opsonization, yeah? It's not complement. We learned about it on a complement date, though, too. <laughs> this is, honestly, every year I, I like do so, I ask something like this, and usually people stare at me and are like, no, we've never heard of this before. So the fact that you're even getting like stuff from the same lecture is a huge improvement. <laughs> What? Not inflammation. Yeah. Not neutralization. You're naming all the things from that day, <laughs> except for this one. So we, one of the functions of antibodies was that they could induce ADCC, antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity, or NK activation. It's the same thing. It's the, NK cells have an FC gamma receptor on their surface, which is one of their NK activating receptors. If a target cell has antibodies on its, uh, or antigens on its surface that can be bound by antibodies of the IgG class, they can bind to those FC receptors, and that will make the NK cell kill the target cell. Sometimes people ask, well, what if the, the antigens are like not on a cell? Like, what if they're just free? And then my answer is, well, then what would the NK cell kill? Um, so we need to have a, a cell to be killed here um, to make this whole process work. So this is one of the sort of well understood NK activating receptors. Um, one other one that we understand relatively well um, is uh, shown here as NKG2D. And I'm going to talk a little bit about NKG2D specifically and NKG2D activation. Yeah. OK. <laughs> um, 
So there are three different proteins that are the ligand for NKG2D. These proteins are either called MCA, MCB, or RAE1. I don't know where that T came from. I've never heard of it as, as RAE-T1. I always learned it as RAE-1. These three proteins are the specific ligands for NKG2D, the activating NK cell receptor. Um, they are turned on by cells when those cells are undergoing cellular stress. If that cell is replicating too much, if that cell um, is, I don't know, having to make virus proteins for a virus, um, if that cell is a cancer cell, that cell generally will start making MCA, MCB, or RAE1. You can see that here. When our cell gets infected, before it was infected, it didn't make the MYC protein, but after it was infected, it did. Similarly, these tumor cells made the MYC protein, and the other ones did not. <laughs> yeah? Is this a different MYC than the MYC spelled with the Y? It is. I hate that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so in the end, um, what we can see is we will see a healthy cell will have class 1 or maybe HLAE presenting a class 1 peptide. That will lead to an inhibitory signal on our NK cell. That happy healthy cell also will not be stressed, so it will not have any stress ligands. So NKG2D will have nothing to bind to it. So we have a min minus signal, we have no plus signal. We can also imagine if we have our unhappy cell, um, that see our unhappy virus infected cell, it doesn't have MHC. So we have nothing to bind to um, our inhibitory receptor, nothing to give a negative signal. And that stressed cell has started making MYC. So we have something to bind to NKG2D and lead to a positive activating signal. And so this is sort of how that NK cell is working. Yep? What's the cell from, uh, from exhibiting both the positive and So the way that this process, though, however, really works in like a real sense is that, in fact, oftentimes our cells will have both some positive and some negative cells or signals. And the way that this works in reality is sort of the, like the NK cell is doing math of how much positive and how much negative is it getting. It's integrating across all the positive and all the negative signals to see whether it's overall activated or overall inhibited. We would have to understand more about activating signals to fully be able to describe that process. <laughs> um, and so yeah, in a perfect world, we can see a situation where we have largely inhibitory signals, maybe a little positive or maybe even no positive. That cell is off. We can see situations where there are no negatives and only positives. That cell is on. But in reality, we often see a little bit more sort of close balance where that cell is integrating um, both its positive and its negative signals. Um, so a couple of other fun things about NK cells. Um, first of all, all of your NK cells have a combo of NK receptors. They don't just have one. Um, and so you can see that each of these NK cells that's shown has some combination of different NK receptors. Um, there seems to be some sort of selection for um, having receptors that match with your MHC or that work well with your MHC. Um, our understanding of how that happens is approximately none or very, very little. But there is something that seems to be going on there. Um, we also know that if you look genetically, um, the combination of NK receptors and MHC class 1 genes that an individual has um, can be associated with disease. So what your personal MHC types are can influence disease following infection. But actually, the combo of MHCs and uh, NK receptors can also influence disease. So you can see that if a person has uh, 3DS1 as well as HLA uh, BW4 with an isoleucine at position 80, they have decreased disease, whereas here they have increased. 
Here you can see if they have 3DS1 and this MHC, increased um, HPV-induced cancer. Difference if they have a different uh, NK receptor and a different MHC. And so this is another place where we can see variation from person to person um, following infection. And the combinations here can be of particular importance. This is something that people are working on learning um, more and more about. Um, one other uh, place where um, NK cells and NK receptors have been studied quite frequently um, is in the immunology of pregnancy. Pregnancy immunology actually is like a whole fascinating subject in and of itself because you basically have this foreign thing that you need to not reject. <laughs> um, there are a lot of aspects of what's going on with the immune system in pregnancy, some of which I'm, I'll talk about later. But one thing that we know is that cells of the extravillus trophoblast, um, which are um, coming from the... Uh, fetus and the, are part of the placenta, which is actually fetal derived, um, have a whole bunch of something called NKG, or sorry, bleh, HLAG. Um, HLAG basically binds to a whole bunch of NK inhibitory receptors and turns off mom's NK cells. So mom's NK cells do not kill the fetus because the placenta is covered with this special class one like molecule, HLAG so that we can ligate um, NK cells and stop any kind of NK killing that might happen for the fetus. Yep? That's only like, like that part of the yeah. Part of the body. Yeah, so, so, so yeah, yeah, so it's just that if an NK cell comes near the fetus, it's inhibited and can't kill the fetus. Yeah? So some of the mutation would Given that they have that there are multiple cures, what if they had a deep or um, I don't know of any of those particular situations. However, I will say that there are other things going on with the immune system in pregnancy that are going to be part of this. So, for example, there's a lot a lot of um, IL-10 produced, and so a lot of any T cells that are around there usually get turned into regulatory T cells. And so there's other stuff going on too. So I don't know exactly what would happen in that case. Yep. So um, that is something that has been um, that's sort of actually a hot area of study right now is, is it possible for, are, are there microbes that can replicate here? There's actually kind of a whole barrier between the fetus and the mom. And there is this big question about can cells replicate here to be able to cross that barrier. There are a short list of um, such viruses, and the reason why this has become such a hot topic is because of Zika, and Zika being one of them, and people have started to stud suddenly study that issue where they didn't so much before because of Zika. And the second question is, as a whole, is there like reduced immunity? Um, it seems that way, yes. Um, so at this point, um, if we look at our NK cells and we say, are NK cells adaptive or innate cells? What would you come down on? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> innate? Why would you come down on innate? Because there's more related things other than just like for adaptive, it's the lineage. Yeah, so for the adaptive, it's the lineage, but the functiony things are more innate. Yeah. You say it's both? OK. So if I had asked you that question, say, 10 years ago, the answer would have, if you looked in immunology textbooks from like 10 years ago, it would say um, NK cells are innate immune cells. And it's for exactly the reasons you guys are mentioning. And the biggest reason why they say, would say that was because of the timing um, that we have. They're part of sort of the early phase of the response as opposed to the later ad uh, adaptive phase. And of course, the fact that they have receptors that don't undergo VDJ was also like pretty strictly used to say these are innate cells.
Um, in 2009, there were, I mean, some of them were a little bit before this, but at least I remember starting to see this literature in 2009. Um, there was some literature that started to come out. Um, if you remember last time I told you the, about this guy who did some experiments named Joseph Sun. Um, the experiments I told you about last time um, were the experiments he did for his PhD to get his dissertation, his PhD. And then he went on to do a postdoc, and then this is what he did for his postdoc. So he got in the he has two figures in your textbook from different parts of his career. Um, he um, took some cells from mice that had been previously infected with a virus, and this virus is called MCMV. He took NK cells from a mouse that had been infected with MCMV. And when he looked at those um, NK cells compared to NK cells from a mouse that had never been infected, he saw that the experienced NK cells were better at killing the naive cells. And he saw that the experienced NK cells could lead to protection if they were transplanted into other mice as if it was a memory response. And so he discovered this phenomenon known as um, NK memory. Now at the beginning, some people were a little bit skeptical of this because MCMV, weirdly enough, is recognized by a special NK receptor. It like has its own NK receptor. And so people were like, maybe this is just like a weird MCMV antigen specific thing. This has since been shown for other pathogens. Um, and so in fact, it now seems as though NK cells display memory. Um, so here, again, um, you can look at the NK um, response in mice that were infected with MCMV over time, and you see that it increases and then decreases, sort of like that nice primary immune response that you're used to seeing with the expansion and the contraction. So it looks just like a primary immune response. Um, and if you take some quote unquote memory NK cells, put them into neonatal mice, um, if you don't give the mice any NK cells, the mice die. If you give them um, some naive NK cells, the mice are OK. So that's 10 to the fourth. If you give them 10 to the fifth, so 10 times more, they're even better. But if you give them 10 to the fourth memory NK cells, they do super well. So they do better than mice with 10 times more <laughs> of the naive cells, which tells you that those memory cells must be really effective. They have improved ability to deal with this virus. Um, and so, yeah, 2009, that's what I thought. Um, and so in the end, um, sort of there was this idea of, okay, so when an NK cell has been activated um, and has sort of received some cytokines and proliferated, we will have NK cells at the end that are somehow different and are somehow better able to respond um, to a, a particular pathogen. Now, if you think about this, it's a little bit tricky because NK cells are not pathogen specific. So it's sort of like we've improved their whole response instead of necessarily uh, improving their antigen specific response. And so the idea here is that NK originally NK cells were sort of this thing that was happening early that was the same in a primary and a secondary response. So it was a little after the myeloid cells, but it was still early. It was the same in the primary and secondary, whereas the adaptive response was different. Now we can see that it looks like the NK cell response is actually looking slightly more like an adaptive type response, even though it is not specific to an individual antigen. Um, so this was sort of, this was honestly, um, so I finished my PhD in 2009. That's why I remember this, because I remember it being something that was coming out right as I was finishing. Um, and so at that time, this is kind of what we had. In the 10 years that have happened since then, um, there have been a couple of sort of places where the field has gone um, with regard to this information. 
we have now realized that in fact, there is something that is referred to as trained immunity. In addition to sort of innate and adaptive, people are now also talking about something called trained immunity. Um, so again, the traditional view was that we had some cells that were innate and we had some adaptive cells. And you can see that the NK cells were traditionally innate. And you can see, look, rapid, effective, nonspecific, lacks memory, delayed, effective, specific memory. It's the same things I wrote on the board over there. Um, and that this is what um, sort of we see, but we are realizing more and more that some of our innate responses may in fact be enhanced upon later infections as this trained immune response. So again, here you can see the B cells and T cells making their memory response. The idea is that NK cells, and now we have also seen that a number of types of macrophages and monocytes can also participate in trained immunity. Once those cells have had one type of um, stimulus, those cells will change and have a better ability to do their effector function. One thing you can notice is they might have more proteins on their surface. These changes are not due to changes in um, DNA in terms of VDJ recombination. We're not breaking, cutting, and pasting the DNA. So this is, and this is not antigen specific. So for example, with the macrophage, you can see that we go from having a little bit of PRRs to having more PRRs. PRRs don't get any more specific. It's just that you have more of them. And the difference here largely seems to be a difference in terms of what's the status of the chromatin and what other types of signaling proteins are there. So are these cells easy or hard to trigger? So you can see that at the beginning, our naive, uh, this, I guess this is supposed to be a macrophage. Beginning our naive macrophage has all of its chromatin tightly, bound, tightly wound. It's not gonna be easy to stimulate. It's gonna open it up, but it's gonna keep that chromatin open. And so that cell is going to be better at responding later on. And so we aren't going to call it memory because it's not remembering a particular microbe. It's just maybe remembering I got stimulated before, or I got cytokines before, um, and potentially leading that cell to make an improved response later on. Um, and so that's this idea of trained immunity. Um, and if you think about it, this uh, makes quite a bit of sense because we've been talking about sort of classic adaptive immunity with gene rearrangement in B cells and T cells. Well, that's only seen in jawed vertebrates. That actually evolved pretty late. The vast majority of organisms on Earth are not jawed vertebrates, but they still get infected with stuff. They still have to make some type of response. And so it seems as though this type of modification of these genes that allows for a better response later on is seen as trained immunity in vertebrates, but is in fact the entire basis of the immune system of invertebrates, is the entire basis of the immune system in plants. Um, and if I really wanted to geek out about things like CRISPR, um, and there are actually some things that people talk about as adaptive or trained immunity in bacteria as well. And so all these other types of organisms still get infected with stuff. You can imagine that having sort of response, responses to previously infecting you pathogens might be a good thing. And so it makes sense that in fact, trained immunity very likely evolved before adaptive immunity because this was an important thing for many organisms and this fancy pants adaptive immunity that we've been talking about all semester is just for the like 0.01% of organisms that have it as like icing on the cake. And so this trained immunity stuff might be a lot more important than the fact that maybe now it's covered for like a couple sentences in textbooks. Um, one other thing uh, or one other place where this field has sort of grown is that there has been this um, increasing recognition that there are an awful lot of cells that are kind of on that borderline between innate and adaptive cells. We've seen some of those cells earlier in the semester as we thought about things like B1 B cells or gamma delta T cells. Um, but we now recognize that there are a whole bunch of cells 
called innate lymphoid cells, or ILCs. Um, they all come from the common lymphoid progenitor. Um, and that cell can either become sort of our classic B cells or T cells. But based on a number of different types of signals, it, they can become NK cells by going through an NK precursor, or they can become one of many types of innate lymphoid cells. None of these cells do VDJ recombination. None of these cells are antigen specific. They don't have T cell receptors. They don't have any type of receptor like that. They have innate like receptors. They have receptors that are not pathogen specific. It's more about cytokines or other types of ligands that they're receiving. Um, but what you can see is that some of them differentiate using some of the same transcription factors that you saw for CD4 uh, helper T cell subsets. And in fact, if you look at what many of these uh, cells do, they do things that sound, they make the same kind of cytokines that some helper T cell subsets do, and they do some of the same functions. Um, and so there is a lot of increasing literature about these cell types called innate lymphoid cells. Um, and this is, again, one thing that a lot of people have started to study more and more. Um, and so in the end, I think people often thought that innate and adaptive immunity were like totally separate, like one evolved in insects and one evolved in us. And like nobody thought, that, or when adaptive immunity started, innate immunity stopped evolving. But what we have actually realized is that the two have been kind of evolving together and influencing one another um, in vertebrates. And this nice, clear demarcation between innate and adaptive immunity is not as clear as we had originally thought. You know, our immune system did not come up with these to easily fit into textbooks. We made these th things up to try to put them in textbooks. Yep, Mark. That's a co-evolution. So like innate immunity factors influencing adaptive immunity um, factors evolution. Um, so Monday's class is always sort of one that I find kind of funny because if you look at sort of how I think about Monday's class, I will tell you that Monday to me is the last day where we are doing like basic immunology. And after that is clinical. And if you look at your if you guys ask, like, think about your perspective, you're going to tell me that Monday is the first day of clinical. So to me, Monday is like totally basic stuff, and you're like, no, we learned about diseases today. And I'm like, no, you learned about basic things. But anyway, <laughs> so, so we're kind of at the transition. We're going to be talking about mechanisms of peripheral tolerance on Monday. Um, and as we see how they get messed up, that starts to lead us to understand how things like autoimmunity happens. And so I will see you guys on Monday.